Hello there. How's it going? So, what's up, everybody? Uh, this is uh, Killing for Company. My name is Kellen. Today we're doing a special episode uh, for uh, Raúl Serrano, who's got a series dedicated to Love at First Listen. So, an album that you heard and uh, loved it right away. So, I just got a handful here for you. A little quick little video response in the background. Hopefully that's coming through just perfectly for you. Uh, this is, get this right, Invultation with Unconquerable Death. I believe this is out of Ohio. Uh, there was an EP from last year in 20. 20 that was circulating that kind of caught my eye and then this year came out with a full length it's been a few sort of bestial black metal records I've been listening to this year and this is definitely up there as one of my favorites um, but I have not you know I've only listened to it in pieces so today we're kind of gonna let it roll here in the background while I'm talking to you and uh, get a chance to spin it a few times today. So we're kind of coming up in the middle of the 2021 year and I've already started to do some list making in my head. So anyway, um, love at first listen. So we've got five, I think five vinyl records here for you. First one is uh, and this is in no order. I just kind of grab some and I'll, I'll kind of talk through my experience with each of them and why um, I think they qualified for Love at First List. And so one of the things that I that kind of, I had to hesitate on this video or when making this video, when going through the selection process, I should say, was this kind of video started to turn into a uh, records that got me into metal list and I had to kind of go back and rethink the process here and what I sort of landed on was records that were sort of second the second wave for me so maybe not the first records that I heard within metal or that made sort of landmark moments within my sort of musical journey um, they got me into the genre, but um, albums that I was able to sort of qualify and distinguish at a greater level as to what my personal interests were, um, they helped sort of concentrate or uh, focus my attention. Um, and this definitely qualifies, this is Pharaoh Be Gone off of Cruel's uh, Del Sur Records in 2008. I know Raul Serrano is very much like a power metal, power metal, heavy metal guy, um, traditional heavy metal, if you will. And this definitely, this is on black, so nothing too special here. I'm going to try and take some more time to like showcase everything that comes with these records. Uh, I watched Rick over the Dreadful Minutes, and he's, you know, in graphic design, so he has like something interesting to say about all the records uh, in terms of their artistic, artistic presentation and why it matters. Um, this sort of giant gem theme is something that you find in all of the Pharaoh albums. So uh, anyway, so this was not the first traditional heavy metal record I ever heard, but um, in terms of power metal, it was one of those Bands, they're still active today. They got a record coming out here in 2012. I'm sorry, 2021. And, um, which I've already started to listen to and it's pretty cool. But, uh, this record just is the perfect sort of blend of uh, American power metal aggression. But there's a little bit of that blue collar ethic that the genre borrowed sort of in the wake of uh, 
the new wave of British heavy metal, right? So if you're looking at American power metal that emerges from the 1980s, to me, it like distinguishes itself by comparison to sort of the European style of power metal by having a little bit more of like a nuts and bolts, like just working man's ethic to it. Um, it, it just sounds very different than the European power metal. This band, though, comes around in 2000, and, like later in the 2000s, obviously, so we're decades later, and there's a bit more of a modern polish to it. Let me turn this up a little bit. Um, so it's a little bit cleaned up. It doesn't sound so rough and tumble as 1980s. Um, American power metal necessarily. All the themes are there. All the, the sort of the hallmarks in terms of um, sort of the grandeur of power metal. But it strays away from um, the European contribution in terms of the like dual uh, lead work, the dual guitars that sort of pair and build melodies off one another. You know, there's sort of that neoclassical sort of influence. It does not, has very little interest in that. So much of these songs are just riff based. Um, interesting, kind of hanging out in the woods here. Um, but in that sense, it, it was just they were really compelling songs that did not have to do with like anything associated with. A Angbe Malmsteen sort of shredder or um, that opulent kind of musicianship that people are used to uh, hearing when they listen to a lot of modern power metal to the point of being like superfluous, right? Like it just sort of wasted energy. There's none of that here. They're just very well composed songs. The, the riffs, once again, to highlight that by comparison to the leads. Um, it just, it's not a lead solo focused band. It's much more like in that like American pocket of um, 1980s power metal. But once again, like I mentioned before, it was polished enough. And I, I, those were things that I could not qualify to a great extent when I first started, started listening to or sort of rediscovering power metal um, in the 2000s when I was getting into metal. But like this had enough of that aggression for me. Um, the vocal style here from let me get the name right. Um, uh, Tim Amar. So they they this band I think from has a shared members with Control Control Denied. Um, just for someone who's like a little bit curious about the band's history. Um, but the vocal style is a little bit like. Uh, gruff is a good way to describe it. It does not have like that big, open, soaring, operatic style, um, and it just lended itself to that kind of aggressive edge um, for me when I was getting into traditional heavy metal. I love this band. They're probably my favorite power metal band still rolling today. So uh, they grabbed me early on, and I have stuck with this. Um, anyway, you should check out their new record. Um, here clips that just came out like this past week, I want to say. They're still on Cruise Del Sur, and uh, one of the best American power metal bands um, going on right now. And they've been at it for a little bit, so I, I would hate to call them kind of like, I don't know, senior members of their class, but um, definitely younger than a lot of the bands that were coming out, like Attacker, per se. I think they're both out of Philadelphia, so. Anyway, moving on. Um, just for one more time, Pharaoh Be Gone, 2008. Okay, this next record. Okay. So, this next record, gosh, oh, this could have qualified as like, uh, album that you know got me into metal, but um, it came a little bit later. But one of the reasons I say that it could qualify, it was one of my first 
um, like a funeral doom record from my generation that I felt just encapsulated everything that I was looking for and that's um, Ahab. Um, what are you going to say? Uh, Spawn of the Wretched Sea. The Call of the Wretched Sea, I'm sorry. Uh, the Call of the Wretched Sea. Um, this right, like from the first few moments, like I hear the opening get like sort of melodic guitar stuff, it just takes me right back and it never gets old. They, they totally nailed, this is on Napalm Records, this is a reissue on black. Um, they completely nailed like the uh, intersection between our album artwork, uh, atmosphere, you know, conjuring the story and sonically matching the narrative. Like the whole experience of chasing a white whale in the sea. Uh, just the way the riffs sound, everything about this um, describes or articulates the experience of someone who was at sea going through, you know, everything that, you know, you got your classic Moby Dick sort of theme here. But I think it's hard, hard for me to overstate that in the sense that Funeral Doom in a lot of ways has that um, that sound where like you have the lead guitar work that's sort of sitting on top of like the incredibly low bellowing um, bottom end to this right like, it's dredging up and then you know falling back down and, and you see that lead guitar where it sort of sits on the, on the top of the surface sort of like light breaking through the water and I, I, for some reason obviously like the nautical themes here could not be more explicit, but it made such an imprint on me. It's difficult for me to listen to Funeral Doom without sort of calling back to this record as a means to understand um, Funeral Doom from going forward. And I just it's, it's a, a great mark of like understanding. The, the role and importance that a singular record could play in your life is like. Oh, drop everything here. Um, this record just completely nailed that for me. And. Don't get too loud. Uh, I, I can't listen to Funeral Doom records from now on and without thinking about this one. Um, it's just that important for me. And uh, I don't have enough good things to say. I think that most people know this record, and if you need to have an Ahab record, I mean, I'll say this, this is the one Ahab record that I have. Um, the rest of them just pale in comparison um, for me personally, but this is just such an achievement. Um, every single, you know, fall, uh, like when it turns, whatever, October, November rolls around, end of September, and I go back looking for my Doom records, I grab this one. Um, so good. Yeah, if you have not listened to this um, at full length, I mean, I definitely recommend getting it on vinyl. Um, Call the Wretched Sea um, from Ahab. 2006, I believe. Um, yeah. Anyway, I fell in love with this record immediately, and it's still, it's like, out of the handful of records that you can listen to, and in the first few notes, everything comes flooding back to you, so that's it. That one, it worked for me for sure. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Okay, something a little bit nasty. We'll take this out of the sleeve here. 
2003, uh, in Hume, in for the kill. With this record, there was bands out of the Netherlands, and uh, so 2003, like most of my metal came through initially grindcore as an extension of punk and hardcore. Um, that was kind of my entrance, and uh, this is one of those bands where like you had conversations with people who were into grind, and this would get thrown in, and it was just so much nastier um, than a lot of the punk stuff. It was difficult. The death metal side of this is difficult to escape. Some wild album artwork, and uh, I think this is on red, but incredibly dense. You know, I think at that time period, you had bands like, on the grind side, you know, like, um, you had bands like Last Days of Humanity, and then like on the brutal death metal side, you have like, severe torture. Um, and this for me like landed smack dab in the middle, where like, I wasn't per se ready for the brutal death metal that severe torture was. Um, you know, in my mind, I think around that time period. Um, but uh, I was definitely in something a bit more gruesome and, and metal oriented than Last Days of Humanity, which was just like, in, you know, intestines inside of a tin can. Um, this is a little bit more riff focused, like you can hear things to a great extent, um, which is the clarity of the structure. Um, what I got though out of this is like, I had also been exposed to when you're sort of taking in early core grind, especially like pitch shifted vocals. And I think the uh, Hoost Silverance is the, is the name. Um, but he does like just straight no pitch shifting vocals and his bottom end and high end are really special. Um, it, it, was, it didn't sound pitch shifted, but it's just so low. And then his high ends are incredibly like uh, scary high as well. All of it with the kind of intensity and aggression that you would expect from a death metal grindcore vocalist. Um, I, I still remember like listening to that and trying to figure out which there was any pitch shifting going on, but. Uh, this is just punishing uh, death grind, and another one of those examples where like this is kind of like the sweet spot for me between it's like it's got enough death metal um, and it's got it's a bit more straightforward with uh, it doesn't waste time sort of delving into the more drawn out dynamics that death metal can get into. Um, uh, so just that sweet spot of, of death grind for me. And I don't see any people talking about it in a lot, um, but you know, this genre only has really so much space often to explore. Um, rarely do you get uh, a record that offers sort of like a three-dimensional lens just because it is so um, punishing sonically. You don't get a lot of the other sort of uh, adjectives or superlatives that you can describe a record just because there is sort of a purity to vision here. Um, but nonetheless, back in 2003, it was like, that was like what I was looking for. Like that was the fringe that I was willing to sort of push myself towards in terms of extremity. Um, and it just nailed that. Uh, to stay still, you know, in terms of death grind, I go back to this record uh, due to how much I enjoy it. So, uh, in Hume, in for the kill, 2003. Okay. Next one. Oh man. Um, Indian. I mean, I, so I, this is kind of a sad story. Um, one of the band members um, passed away. I, I, I don't. I don't want to speak to specifically how he died. I don't remember off the top of my head the details, but I know uh, they put out a handful of records until I want to say somewhere in like 20, last one, it was like 20,
2014, 15 maybe. Anyway, um, so the Unquiet Sky, that's this one here. And open up this. Whoa. Um, this record was around 2005. And speaking of like where I was and what my tastes were, um, so if the kind of at the moment, like if you think about like the sludge and doom scene that was going on, um, kind of this crazy black, white, or black, red, I should say, splatter. Um, there was a whole lot of Post metal going on at the time, and, and sludge and drone was becoming a thing. You had like all those like Southern Lord sort of, you know, Sun um, is gaining popularity. But like, I remember, you know, like bands like Pelican, um, and Hesu, and all of that. So this was a sludge record that came around, and it was just so like a step for me it just a step in the opposite direction no receiving on camera put this to the side here we go uh, it was just a step in the opposite direction it was like death metal and also had some noise to it um, you had that kind of like electronic distortion element that just heightened the level of uh, sonic dissonance um, that took it a step beyond what sludge could have you know, traditionally um, accomplished. And, yeah, Seventh Rule recordings. Um, in my mind, Seventh Rule was out of Chicago, but I could be wrong about that. It may have been out of Portland. In my mind, it's Chicago. If you, you can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong about that. Um, here we get all sorts of like bondage and porn plus. You know, it looks like uh, different acts of mutilation and war crimes. Um, anyway, so it's got plenty of things that thematically that went on with Sludge, but it was just a step beyond in terms of traditionally what I what I got picked up from Sludge. Which to me, as my Indian is, is sort of like a death doom sludge. But that death metal aggression um, is what, what really stood out to me and kind of opened a new window. Um, instead of going like the Baroness, you know, another band that was sort of playing at the time and was sort of heading in an opposite direction, you know, my, by 2005 when this record came out, my interest in metal were getting more aggressive. Like I was, had more interest in gravitating towards um, a, a metal aesthetic and sound, and sort of leaving a lot of what you know punk had uh, established or been a part of my experience. I wanted to leave that kind of that behind and get more and more into the metal side of things. And Indian, like, sort of connected. Uh, my interest in extreme metal like death metal or black metal or so on and so forth um, into a, a sludge context and uh, with that added element of noise it's just um, really interesting listen and over time I would say this is probably like one of their more aggressive uh, albums to date but because um, they kind of developed like they kind of cleaned everything up and got a little bit more sharpened with a melodic uh, uh, edge to them over the years, but still an awesome record. Um, Indian, The Unquiet Sky. I think this has got a couple of represses and different like um, vinyl treatments over the years, but um, Killer Man, and you know, one of the few sort of projects that like I feel, you know, I got there from the, from the ground floor, you know, and then hung out, see what the band sort of developed in to later. So anyway, Indian Unquiet Sky, 2005, Seventh Rule Records.
Last one. This is Aaron Alter uh, with By Honor. So I was uh, living in South Korea, and I remember being in a bar, and a couple of my, like a couple of my friends, we would just shut down a bar and like play our favorite um, records or, or songs. We just would go to YouTube and like pick a song, and because we would buy drinks all night, whatever the bar owners let us kind of shut down the place and turn it into our own little metal spot. And uh, one of my friends put the title track of off this album on. And it was one of those, like, we were just trading songs during the course of the evening, and I put this on, and you kind of aren't thinking about it, and then a couple of minutes in, I just got completely captivated. Um, it's, it was, you know, pagan black metal, right? Like, Viking pagan black metal. But at the same time, um, this sort of the song sort of epic doom qualities, it was the perfect mix. And I had not thought about blending the two, right? Like I was just becoming versed in both sort of genres. Not, you know, needless to say, I would, the idea that they could ever be sort of uh, brought together like this and, and so well executed. But once again, just like the, um, the Call of the Wretched Sea from Ahab sort of nails that, like, riding the waves um, in search of, you know, the white whale. Uh, this nails the, you know, you're on your, you know, Viking sort of vessel, like, sailing, you know, into the fjords. Like, it, it's, it's, it's the, the scale of the riffs and just getting lost into sort of that sort of undulating doom, essentially, but it has, you know, it's written with the same sort of <coughs> melodic sensibility that you got from, you know, pagan, black metal. Um, so it, that's some, the, the, the combination of the sung vocals within this sort of scene or um, cultural background um, was just amazing to me. And uh, it's still like a, a hallmark in terms of what ought to be to me is a pagan black metal record. I know people look at this at, as a Bathory, um, right? Like worship band to some degree, but you know, to me it's somewhere between like at the same time, you know, Moon Sorrow and Doom Sword. Um, like they're just a, a greater sense of like a it captured you know something that was important to both those sort of subgenres um, that other bands had, had done a great job sort of explaining or articulating on older records and then once they were sort of distilled um, and concentrated you know Arab Alter found a way to sort of make that bring some synergy to both them and uh, gave this uh, this project some life. And I think, you know, early on, it's very much this pagan side. They turned into a little bit more of an aggressive black death metal band over the years. Um, and to some degree, I think Eternus, which is another favorite of mine, shares that kind of trajectory. But um, By Honor is one of my favorite uh, pagan uh, black metal records. And I see that, you know, first and foremost, by comparison to like an epic Doom record, per se. So, um, that's all I got for you today. I think that I timed this perfectly with the, uh, <laughs> our, our opening, our invitation, Unconquerable Death Dies Along With My. So, I'm just going to cut it here. Thank you so much, uh, Rodolfo Serrano. I'll put a link to his um, channel. Go check him out. He's got a bunch of cool stuff going on. And uh, thanks so much for the video idea. Until then, I'll see you later. Bye.